Hello everyone, this is Zhang Chen. I'm a PhD student from the University of Michigan. Today, in this lecture, I will talk about uh, real variant association tests. Here is the overview of this lecture. In the first part, I will introduce the limitations of GYS. In the second part, I will talk about the rationale for real variant analysis. After that, I will introduce analgesic state, burden, and state O. Finally, I will uh, introduce this robust state, burden, and state O. Uh, you know, a missing heritability is found in GWAS studies, in most GWAS studies. This is because GWAS often focus on common variants. You know, uh, most significant GWAS NIPs can only explain a small proportion of disease heritabilities. There are multiple reasons behind that. First, it, it, it can be uh, because of G by G or G by E interactions. It can also because um, you know many common causal variants can contribute with only very small effect size. And then, Another possible reason behind that is that uh, real variants can contribute to the genetic heritability rather than common variants. Next, uh, here is a comparison between common versus real variants. Uh, for common variants, the minor allele frequency is often larger than 1% or 5%. These two percentages are very common cutoffs between common and real variants. Common variants often have very high correlations with adjacent SNPs, which, which, because, uh, which is because of uh, the high LD. You know. For real variants, and they are most uh, driven, uh, they are most uh, relative new mutations, they often have very weak correlations with other SNPs. Why do we interested in real variants? This is because um, uh, most of human variants are very rare, and also functional variants tend to be rare. You can find out uh, these two conclusions through this figure, and this figure is based on the top med data. If you look, uh, if you look at the number of variants in common variants and in terms of common variants and real variants, we can find that uh, real variants have much more uh, in both coding and non-coding region. You know, one issue of real variants is that a single variant association tests are underpowered for real variants. You know, large samples are usually required to observe real variants. For example, if we are interested in the variant with minor real frequency p, and if we want to observe it with at least theta chance, the sample size required can be calculated based on this formula. For example, if theta equals 99.9%, then the required minimum sample size uh, is in this following table. For example, if the minor allele frequency is 0 0.0001, the minimum sample size is more than 34,000 individuals. Further, we are interested in calculating how many subjects needed to achieve 80% power by single variant tests. In this figure, the x-axis is the effect size, and the y-axis is the required sample size. For example, if the minor allele frequency is 0 0.001, if the true effect size is 5, then we need approximately uh, 20,000 individuals to achieve 80% power. And also, we know that in reality, the true effect size is generally it's more. It's very, very hard to achieve the, uh, the effect size as high as 5. 
So which means we need much more samples to in order to achieve 80% power for real variance. So uh, in order to increase the power in association tests for real variance, uh, one, gen one natural idea is to test the joint effects of a real variance by grouping real variance into functional units, let's say genes or some typical regions. For example, in this gene, we can group in real variance into promoter coding regions and the termi uh, termination uh, sequence. We can also test all real variance in this gene together. Here, I will introduce methods for region or gene-based tests. Consider uh, this following question. If we have n independent observations, and we already know the phenotype we are interested in, the, and the covariates we need to adjust, and all genotype information of real variants in this region. The question is that whether we can get a appropriate p-value of this real variant region. The existing methods include SCAD burden and SCAD O and C alpha tests. And in this lecture, we are particularly interested in SCAD burden and SCAD O. Here is a model of a gene-based tests. For continuous traits, we can consider the following linear regression model. And for binary traits, we can consider the following logistic regression. And here is the notation of these two models. Uh, y is the outcome. Xi is the vector containing all the covariates, including the intercept. And then Gi is the genotype vector of real variance with length m. So we are interested in testing uh, whether beta equals zero or not. Here, I will introduce burden, scat, and scat of statistics. First, the burden statistic, uh, statistics uh, essentially aggregate the, all the variance with the weight function. This is because it assumes that the directions of all variance are the same in this gene. So, uh, however, burden scat statistic doesn't require the similar assumption. We can say it, uh, it takes a square for all variants and then times a uh, weight function. In this case, SCAD can do better in, if, on the, if the, all the variants in this region have very different directions. And the SCAD O essentially is a linear combination between burden and the SCAD. And the rule is a tuning parameter with a range from 0 to 1. Here is a figure to show when we should use scat burden or scat O. For example, if we are interested in testing the coding region in this gene, for example, if we know the directions of all variants as the same in this coding region, then we can do burden tests. However, if the directions in this coding region can be different, let's say uh, plus minus plus plus minus, this kind, if we have this kind of trend, then we can use scat. Uh, for example, if we don't know the uh, directions of uh, variance in this gene, probably we can use get O in order to achieve the best power. Suppose score statistics SJ can, uh, is written by this formula. We found that essentially burden statistics and the score statistics can be written as a function of score statistics SJ. And under the now, which means beta uh, equals zero, and this S, asymptotically follows multivariate normal distribution, where C is the correlation matrix among m variants. 
and then V is a diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements are the asymptotic variance of S. And uh, stat burden and stat O can be implemented in R package stat. When the case control ratio is unbalanced, for example, 1 to 99, we found all existing methods have inflation of type of error rates. For example, you can see uh, for our just stat burden and stat O, all three methods suffer from the huge inflation of type of error rates. This is the intuition why we come up with this robust region-based test. The main idea is very simple. Under the null, which means uh, beta equals zero, we assume S follows a multivariate normal distribution, right? However, when the case control ratio is unbalanced, the distribution of S are not normal, so which can cause the misleading p-values. So we are going to address this issue through two steps. In first step, we try to estimate the uh, distribution accurately to calculate the single variant p-values in this region through uh, two approaches. The first one is called saddle point approximation, which is known as uh, SPA, and the other one is called efficient resampling. And in step two, we re-estimate the diagonal variance matrix so that the single variant p-values are exactly the same as p-values from SPA or efficient resampling. So after that, we can estimate the p-value of this region accurately. And then this robust method can also be implemented by in, the, in, our, in our package set. Here is a brief introduction of saddle point approximation. You know, uh, normal approximation can generally perform well near the mean, but poorly at the tails, especially if the true distribution is very skewed. This is because, you know, normal approximation only incorporated the first and second moments, moments, right? So, which is mean and variance, and it cannot incorporate higher moments such as a skewness. However, you know, a cumulant generating function CGF is a one-to-one -one mapping to the distribution, so which essentially uh, incorporates all moments uh, in this di distribution. So, saddle point approximation is based on this CGF. The CGF can be uh, derived based on the fact which is why I follows Bernoulli distribution under the null. And based on that, we can further calculate p-values through this SPA approach. Although SPA performs much better than normal approximation, SPA is still a symptotic-based approach, which means uh, when the minor allele count is very small, uh, SPA can still result in very inaccurate p-values. So this is the motivation why we incorporate efficient resampling in our model. Uh, efficient resampling is a kind of resam uh, resampling technique, but it only resamples the case control status of individuals with a minor allele at a given variant instead of permuting case control status across all individuals. This is because only individuals with minor alleles will contribute to the score statistics S, so which can help us save a huge computation time and memory issue. If we look at the figures on the right, for example, we have 10,000 uh, 10, samples in total. Uh, for example, only three samples have this uh, kind of a typical minor allele. So we can only resample case control status among these three samples to calculate the exact p-value instead of permuting all case control status across all 10,000 samples. Here is the procedure of our robust region-based test. First, we calculate the uh, score statistics for variant J, uh, if this value is uh, lies within two standard deviation, we can directly use normal approximation. This is because of a computational 
concern and also you know normal optimization can behave well near the mean part if the square set is lies beyond the qcn division we can use either efficient resampling or spa based on the minor low count of this variant after that we can adjust the variance of sj so that the p value is exactly the same as pj tilde calculated from efficient resampling or spa and finally this p value the p value of the region can be calculated based on the assumption that this s follows uh, multi, a multivariate normal distribution after that we did some simulation studies to evaluate the table error rates uh, this is a typical simulation study uh, essentially we include 50,000 independent individuals with four different case control ratios one to, from 1 to 1 to 1 to 99 and we also include uh, two covariates which uh, the first one follows Bernoulli distribution and the second one follows uh, normal distribution and the binary phenotypes were simulated from this following formula through the simulation, we found that robust methods has very well controlled the type of error rates. If you look at this table, uh, the number in each cell represents the type of error rate divided by the alpha label, which means if this value is close to 1, which means uh, there is no inflation of type of error rates. If, if the value is much larger than 1, then it shows the huge inflation of type of error rates. When the case control ratio is 1 to 99, you can find that the unadjusted unjust, state, uh, this, uh, the value in unadjusted state is over 90. However, our robust state, this value is about 1.8, which is very close to 1. Essentially, we can find a similar patterns for robust state, robust burden, and robust state out. After that, we further compare the computation time between robust methods and unadjusted methods. We can find that uh, robust state O has very similar computation time as unadjusted state O in all situations, no matter of the sample size and the case control ratios, which means our new method, robust method, is scalable for large data analysis. This robust method was also applied in UK Bell band whole exome sequencing data. In this data analysis, we analyzed 791 binary phenotypes with at least 50 cases based on the fetals. If you look at the ratio of control divided by the case, you can find this ratio is highly skewed to the right. And then we analyze the, uh, the real variance of the non synonymous and splicing variance in the exome and the neighborhood regions. And the total of uh, over 18,000 genes remain for our analysis. We, in our model, we adjusted for age, gender, and the first four principal components. Through this application, we found uh, 10 significant gene phenotype association pairs with a cut of 10 to minus 7. And the associations with red colors were, are previously reported, and all uh, 10 significant associations remain significant after adjust the most significant common variance nearby. So if you look at the conditional p-values and all 10 p-values remain significant after adjust for uh, the most significant common variance. And here are the scatter plots of single variance in these 10 significant genes. For example, if you look at uh, the first figure, JAK2, we can see the significance in this region is mostly driven by one single variant. And if you look at the second figure, old one in this gene, the significance in this region is mostly driven by the small 
different sizes of all real variants in this gene, uh, which basically shows that the uh, region-based or gene-based tests have larger power than single variant tests. Finally, we put our summary statistics in the field web. For example, in this website, you can find out uh, the GWAS figures. It is easy for users to find out which genes are significant, uh, significantly associated with a certain trait. Similarly, we also uh, support these FIWAS figures. For example, if you are interested in atypical genes, you can find out uh, which traits the gene, the, this gene is associated with. Finally, here is the acknowledgement and references. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And if you want to know more details, you can look at these papers and you can also let me know if you have any questions regarding this lecture. Thank you very much.